this is Mazm Shah. I am one of the solution architect at Automation Anywhere. Uh, so I will be taking you through a live uh, demonstration of what Discovery Bot is and how you can actually get started uh, utilizing Discovery Bot today. Uh, so what you're seeing here on my screen is our Automation 360 control room. And control room essentially is the entire orchestrator for everything that needs to happen. Now, before I log in, I want to make it clear that Discovery Bot really revolves around three different personas. Uh, the first one being the Discovery Bot administrator, uh, the second one being the Discovery Bot user, and the third one is the Discovery Bot analyzer. So, Discovery Bot administrator is uh, the end all be all person who can invite people to the processes that need to be worked on or recorded, uh, and they can create the processes or delete the processes as well. So, let me first log in as my Discovery Bot admin, who is Steve Rogers. And I will log in as Steve Rogers. And if you guys are Marvel fans, you'll know what I'm talking about. So what we see here is uh, my page, my landing page essentially for, uh, the, for the control room itself. Now within here, like Sam was mentioning that Discovery Bot is an integrated platform within our Automation 360. So if you have given it the right roles or given Steve the right roles, he will see the Discovery Bot tab on the left-hand side. And if he clicks on it, you can see the different uh, uh, sub-tabs for the process. And just clicking on the process, uh, he will dive directly into what processes he needs to create and what type of people he wants to involve within that process. So simply what I can do is I can already see the first different process and I can see there are different eight different types of recordings that have been submitted. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new process. So I click on create process and here I give it a name and I'll call it a uh, demo uh, webinar process for this case. Once I name it, I can give it a description, which is technically uh, optional, but will definitely help the users who are involved with it. Uh, so inviting the users. Now we see uh, three different users and one is also including the admin themselves. So these are the two users who are part of the discovery bot mission. So one is the user and the other is the analyst. So Steve invites both of them to this particular recording. So one can report the process, submit it, and then after submission, the other can analyze the, what the reporting uh, is looking like and then take further action upon it. So once uh, Steve creates the process, after inviting the people, Steve essentially is done with his job. And then now we can see the demo, demo webinar process uh, that's already you know, populated within here. And Steve can now log out of the control room. Now, once this process gets created and the people get invited, they will essentially receive an email notification that they have been invited to this process. And within that email, there's an embedded link for the control room itself, so they can directly log into the control room. Now, as part of the user, I will first go ahead and log in as Wanda, who is uh, going to be acting as the discovery bot user in this scenario. So once I log in, I can see the same landing page, and then she also has the access to Discovery Bot, and under Discovery Bot, she has access to the processes that she can work on. In this scenario, uh, she has access to the Discovery Bot process, um, the demo webinar process, and zero recordings have been submitted so far, and she can go ahead directly start the recording from here with a single click. Now, the use case that I'm going to take you through is a pretty simple one, but it's definitely effective. Um, so we're going to be leveraging our web-based application and I'm going to be utilizing my uh, you know, Gmail because we have 200 emails. So we want to be able to read through these emails. And then I'm going to be simultaneously working on an Excel workbook uh, for uh, account creation perspective. And I'm going to be looking at certain criteria that these people need to meet uh, essentially for this particular use case. It's a pretty simple one, like I mentioned. And I will do a, uh, two different recording sets uh, for this particular use case. And I'll tell you exactly why once we get there. So let's go ahead and uh, let's start the recording. So once uh, I start the recording button, uh, what this is gonna do is it's, this is gonna populate uh, a tiny control panel uh, towards the bottom screen as you can see it. And now this means that the discovery bot recorder is now active and it's going to capture everything and anything that Wanda essentially interact with, interacts with on her screen. Now, Discovery Bot doesn't only work with uh, you know, a single primary screen. If you have multiple screens and you are you know, looking at different types of applications and different monitors, it will still capture uh, uh, all of your interactions with the different applications as well. So I've moved that panel onto the side so we have a clean slate. Now here, as you can see, uh, we can start interacting with different object sets. Uh, so if I click on uh, 
my email account, I can start working the way I want to and just start looking into all the different actions and scenarios that I need to work with. So here I've opened up Karen Stokes email and I can see the different areas that are being captured by the discovery bot recorder itself. So here I'll check her information for the ID. I'll go back and I'll check her information on the uh, earning statements and pay stub. And then that looks good. I'll also check on the, uh, the utility bill in this case, so I can get her information on where she resides. All three criteria are met by Karen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into Excel and I'm actually going to go onto Karen and I'll do some keystrokes. I'll type in, mark them as X. So meaning that these are essentially done. Now what happens is uh, this is my first iteration of the recorder aspect itself. I do wanna go ahead and stop it. Now I'm stopping for a reason because let's say you have multiple different people who are part of the same exact recording and they are doing different types of actions with the different uh, you know, users in this case, for example. So there might be some exceptions that are probably going to be raised on this because not every uh, you know, process on the same process, or every person's not gonna be doing the same exact process the same exact way. So you're going to be seeing a lot of different recordings being submitted that are uh, done differently, but the end goal is exactly the same. So I'm going to go ahead and do a one more iteration of this recording. As we can see, uh, one has been submitted. Let me go ahead and start the recording once again, and we'll see more of an exception scenario in this case. So once this discovery bot recorder launches again, uh, we will uh, go ahead and, and start recording on the second process. So here I'll click back onto my Gmail. I go back to my inbox. And then in this case, I go onto John Doe's screen. And then I can see his earning statements and this you know, looks good. And then in this case, I go ahead and pull up his uh, license information for his identity and that all looks good and matches. Uh, and in this case, I don't have a third one. So I will go ahead and look at uh, you know, John Doe's information uh, wherever he is hiding. So ID is checked, um, salary is checked, but not the address information because I could not verify that. So in this case, what I'm going to do, I'm going to mark this as an incomplete process, essentially, and this is more like an exception. So now two of these recording sets have been completed, and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording again. Now in this scenario, what you will see is I will have two different recordings that will be submitted. And once as a user, I will be going ahead and looking at these recordings. Now these recordings can essentially be uh, you know, taken care of towards the end of the cycle of your day, for example, if the user wants to get back to it and you know, work, save a little bit of time towards the end of the day to kind of look at the steps that have been captured uh, and then edit the steps uh, that may be needed before submitting the request uh, to the analyzer. So here we'll click on the recordings and we should see two of these recordings that are now part of this particular process. And they both have two different IDs with the pending status, and each of them have their own different process cycle time. Now here, uh, Wanda can see all the different steps that she has taken, and all of them have been recorded. Now, if she clicks on it, she can see what this step was, where was she clicking, uh, she, can, she can see all the different details uh, about this, this particular step. And let's say if there was one step that was not needed, uh, and she can simply you know, click this trash icon and she can delete that particular step. And as part of that, uh, information that she provides clicks on, provides keystrokes on, all of that will be captured as user data. Uh, some of that may be in plain text, but uh, we don't typically put all the information. So let's say if there was some sensitive information like a password capture, that will be captured as a user entered data instead. It is good to provide step descriptions because Wanda wants to tell the analyzer what step that she took in here. So in here I can say, um, uh, go to email, for example. And then in the next one, I can say, uh, click on unread email. And then I'll do one more. And I'll say, look at John Doe's uh, account request email. So let's say I do this for all the different steps. And if I come across any kind of PII related data, so let's take a look at this screenshot. I can see the earning statements here. And this is some information that I don't like to provide 
uh, further. So what I can simply do is I can hide this image and this image is now hidden as part of this entire recording when this, once this gets submitted. And this will be propagated down to the analyzer. And once the analyzer converts this to a bot, we will still see the hidden image at this point. We can do the same thing for this type. We can simply click this eye icon and it will hide that particular screen. Uh, so let's say if this looks good, uh, and if Wanda wants to look at other uh, uh, different recordings, she can simply save it, and then she can come back to this recording to submit it. Once this is saved, we can take a look at the second recording as well, which was the first iteration uh, for Terran Stokes. Uh, we can probably do similar actions on here. We can remove this one. Uh, we can, uh, uh, let me add a couple more. I'll just do uh, click uh, on to unread email. And then look at Heron's account request. So things like that, let's say Wanda has entered all this information and she thinks everything looks good for submission. She can go ahead and save it if she wants to, or she can go ahead and directly submit it. Now, once she submits it, we can see the status of this pending has been changed to approved. Let me go ahead and do the same thing for the second one. And this has been now successfully submitted and changed to approved. Now this approved status doesn't mean that it's now approved and ready to go for automation. This simply means that it's now approved by the user or the recorder, and it's now ready to be viewed by the analyst themselves. At this point, uh, Wanda's work is essentially done and she doesn't have any more recordings to be uh, you know, submitted or in pending state. So she can go ahead and you know, go about her day, uh, do some other stuff, more recordings if she wants to, or she can simply log out. Now let's take a look at uh, what the discovery bot analyzer sees. So we'll log in as Natasha and Natasha will see information from a different angle. So she also sees discovery bot here and under discovery bot, instead of one tab, now she sees two sub tabs and one is for processes, one is for opportunities. So let's click on the processes. So she sees the same amount of information as uh, Wanda has seen because Steve uh, invited them to both, uh, right? So we click on the demo webinar and we see the two recordings have been submitted. And in this scenario, uh, what Wanda sees is a landing page of a dashboard that gives her quite a bit of useful information on the app, on the uh, recordings for the process that have been submitted and approved by Wanda. <clears throat> now this scenario tells me what types of applications were involved uh, at the bottom here, how many were involved, how many participants were involved, what the cycle time was uh, uh, for these for this process, and then a comparison of the timeline of what the cycle was essentially for these different types of recordings. Now, to an analyzer, this provides a lot of value right up front because they can see exactly how heavy or light this process may be, right? So how the frequency of this is, how many participants usually work on this type of process, how many applications does it involve? So that can give me a good amount of idea if this opportunity or use case is well worth being put into the automation pipeline, right? So as we can see, we have dashboard aggregation and then comparison. So let's go into the comparison side. So as an analyzer, uh, Natasha can look up to three different recordings at a time and compare and contrast them and then see what the differences were. So we can kind of see like a nice flow view in here with the different types of steps that are coupled. Uh, and in this case, right now I'm showing the application type, which is Chrome in this scenario. And in this scenario, uh, we're showing Excel, but we can switch between the application view and a thumbnail view. So in this scenario, we'll see, uh, you know, the application uh, steps or the application itself this scenario. And remember, uh, we had hidden some steps uh, within the recording aspect of it. So now those are being followed through within this comparison mode as well. And then we should see the same thing uh, uh, on this side as well, right? So this is from a con comparison view. So you can compare and contrast up to three different recordings, uh, as many as you may have over here. Let's go to the aggregation mode. And in the aggregation mode, what you typically see is an aggregated view of all the different types of recordings that will be approved and submitted for analysis. Now, this provides some valuable information to the analyst 
because they can see a single view of multiple different recordings that have been submitted. This is absolutely needed. And this is really where Discovery Bot shines and really discovers how the process will actually be automated, right? So if you have multiple users working on a single process, they will be utilizing different ways to get to the same end goal. But at the end of the day, if you think about it, there can only be one standardized way or approach to automate that particular process. This is why the aggregation is really, really important within Discovery Bot, and it's provide, it provides you with uh, you know, ample information on what needs to be done. Now, if there are differences, it will tell you, uh, uh, along with the, with the branching of different types of applications and actions, and it will tell you uh, what, uh, similar, what similarities are between the different types of reportings. Now you can choose uh, as an analyst, uh, an analyst and RPA people are, uh, can be the same in this scenario, or they could be two different folks. But let's say they're wearing both hats. You can view different modes or models within your aggregation view. So if I see, uh, by default, it goes to an easy model, uh, and I can choose between the strict model and the easy model. So if I choose between the strict model, the difference really is that easy is more of a soft touch, as I call it, on the aggregation side. Uh, and it looks behind the scenes, the Discovery Bot engine looks at the different types of attributes uh, for the application types that are being, uh, uh, that, are, that are in play. And those attributes are about five to six different attributes that it looks at and then makes a collation and a comparison between these different recordings. So less deviations. If you click on to a strict mode and apply that, you'll see how the aggregation actually switches and changes. Now, the strict mode, looks at a lot more different uh, attributes and object properties behind the scenes. And it gives you a more of a granular comparison to see if there were any other deviations that may be a part of it that EZ is not showing. So a strict model may be a lot more valuable in terms of what needs to be seen in the aggregation view. And to be able to point out exactly where the deviations might be uh, within the discovery bot aggregation for these different processes. Now here, as we can see, there are two separate uh, you know, work streams here. Uh, one is, you know, for uh, John Doe, and then one is for Terrence Stokes. So we are kind of getting those differences as well. The similar actions don't get coupled. Uh, the different actions do get branched out, right? So from this point on, uh, you can start to take a look at uh, what the step details might be. Uh, like, so you can uh, see the exact step and the detail Wanda had entered uh, onto the step description. So this is important uh, for documentation purposes. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So once the aggregation is done and looks good, uh, the auto aggregation makes a lot of sense because it alleviates a little bit of work from the analyst or the RPA side. But let's say if you really wanted some full control over the aggregation aspect of it, you can also do that. And you can do that by clicking this create view icon here. So if you click on this icon on the top right hand corner, what this will do is this will grant you uh, to ask you for a title and we will say um, uh, webinar view, for example, webinar view, and then we can create that. Now, once we create this view, now this view, uh, you can add more recordings to it that may not be part of it. And you can start to add a lot more deviations from different types of recordings as you see fit and uh, make the aggregation a lot more manual in that sense. Uh, you can decide where the branch needs to come out of. You can decide what actions need to be coupled together or split apart essentially. So it gives you full control over the types of aggregations you need. And then on the right hand, on the left hand side here, it has started an initial set of view. And you can you know, work on it, you can delete it. If you want to, you can copy and make a different set of it. You can work on this, you can save it later on if you really wanted to do so. So let's say uh, this aggregation view looks decent and I wanna go ahead with it and creating an opportunity based around this. So what I can simply do is I can you know, select all the different steps. And because I'm working in this view, so my opportunity name has already been created here, unless until I wanna give it a different name, let's stick with the webinar view. Now in this scenario, what an analyzer will do is gonna do some cost analysis on this particular opportunity. Uh, and this is currently done uh, manually. So there will be a bit of understanding coming into play on 
how the cost model is working for the FTEs, how many times this process is being utilized, and how much time in the cost uh, and time estimate and cost estimate goes into play. So those details go in here. So what is the average cost estimate and what are the potential savings? So let's say I wanna you know, say it takes $100 for each FTE you know, every quarter or something. And that's the amount uh, that it takes uh, away from my pocket every single time an FTE is working on it. Potential savings, if I was to automate this process, a little bit of calculation comes in, but let's just say $100,000 every quarter that I can save. That typically is a lot of money, right? So I wanna prioritize this at a high level. So by dropping this down, I can go into high, medium, or low. So in this case, I'll set the priority for this use case at a high, and I can go ahead and create the opportunity. Once the opportunity gets created, I get a little notification at the top. And now I can actually go into my opportunities section and then view what other opportunities I have had. Now in this scenario, I will see uh, a PDD is in generation currently, right? So if I refresh it, now we can download this particular PDD. Now this uh, is good information from a developer's perspective. So this is where the documentation approach really comes into play. All of the steps have been you know, single-handedly documented and we don't really need to work off of it anymore uh, on, in a manual basis. So if you look at this document, we can see all good information and relative information to this particular use case. What the opportunity name is, uh, you know, what, uh, who did it, what the potential savings might be, what types of applications are involved and how much of an involvement each of them have. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see all the different types of steps. And steps, uh, you know, have their descriptions to it, right? As Wanda was describing, so step descriptions are important so we can break that wall between the business user SME or the process owner and the developer, right? So the developer can see exactly what's going on. And then we can see all the information and we can also see that we had hidden this PII related data. And now that's also part of this particular document. Uh, so this is uh, how uh, Discovery Bot can help you document the process across multiple different recordings and an aggregated view. And you can keep that uh, in your back pocket, if so, you require to view this over and over again. Now let's go ahead and then see uh, what this uh, opportunity looks like from a conversion standpoint. So if I click on this opportunity, I can see the dashboard again. Again, you know, seeing uh, you know how many applications were involved, participants, the process cycle time, all that good stuff. We can still see the aggregated view, uh, and this is where you know all the information comes back together from different types of recordings, and then. If the, uh, and this may be done by a different role, for example, it could be an RPA manager, or it could be an approver uh, of you know, automation as a pipeline. So let's say if this looks good and it's good to get automated, we can simply click on this convert to bot button on the top right, top right hand corner, and we can see the conversion happen in real time. And once I click this, uh, I can name this bot, whatever I need to be to start it off. I can say webinar view bot, and I can select the folder which I want to create this automation under. So by default, I'll select this bots, which is uh, the very top layer of my folder uh, structure. So now this information will get converted into uh, this particular folder structure. So if I hit convert, it works pretty quickly. The bots get, bot gets converted or the, the process gets converted into an automation. And now we can go ahead under bots section within the control room, no change of application, notice that, right? So everything is part of the same platform. Uh, click on my bots, then we can see the webinar view bot has been generated here uh, just now. So if we click on it, we can actually see the conversion of all the different steps that Wanda had taken. And now they're part of uh, this uh, bot, which gives you a good, uh, set of instructions and a good starting point. So it's by no means a, a readily available bot that could be deployed into production. It definitely gives you a good skeleton or a prototype and a good starting point to give you a head start on how to build this automation out. So all the different types of branches have get uh, are converted into like an if and else statements. And if you click on each of these scenarios, we can exactly see you know, what's been going on. Uh, right, so we can see all these different types of properties uh, based on that. And uh, if there was any hidden type of data, we can see 
that preview is also hidden in this bot uh, format as well. Now, from a developer perspective, uh, this will obviously take a little bit of work uh, to make sure that you know, we are ready to test this bot out. So it needs to go through that same SDLC uh, you know, cycle and making sure that everything gets uh, you know, accounted for before it is ready to go out into UAT for testing and then promote it out into production for a production ready bot. Um, so that's the overall you know, view of Discovery Bot, how we can make it work from a certain entity that wasn't even a use case for automation, converting that into an opportunity and plugging that into your automation pipeline by giving it a conversion to a bot and giving the RP developers a head start onto the automation journey.